Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much for those who've been watching my previous videos. Today's Come Follow Me video comes from the first lesson for June, which is titled The Lord Raised Up a Deliverer. Uh, this lesson covers chapters 2 through 4, chapters 6 through 8, and chapters 13 through 16 in the book of Judges. So we're going to be dealing with, uh, well, it's each uh, each story is about a different leader or a different hero, I guess you could say. Uh, Judges 2 through 4 is about uh, the story of Deborah. Judges 6 through 8 is about the story of Gideon. And Judges 13 through 16 is about the story of Samson. Many of you probably know the story of Samson. It's probably out of the three. It's, it's probably the most famous. Uh, in my opinion, it didn't have as much... Uh, gospel doctrine in there to be shared, though it is a really cool story. I would encourage you to read it, but we're not going to be talking about uh, the story of Samson in this lesson, other than to say, you know, if you know the, the story of Samson, that God really likes those who honor their covenants, and after his hair got cut, uh, which was a covenant of the Nazarites, he no longer had the same power of the Lord. Other than that, there's not really a lot that I want to share from that story, uh, so we're going to focus on the first two stories uh, coming from Judges chapters 2 through 4 and chapters 6 through 8. Now, the book of Judges, unlike the book of Joshua, doesn't just cover a small snippet in Israelite history over a course of days or a couple things that happened in a really short amount of time like the book of Joshua. The book of Judges covers roughly 400 years. Now, there isn't an exact... Uh, chronology. There are a lot of different scholars and sources that will say different dates, but the best estimation is somewhere around 1400 BC to somewhere around 1000 BC, so roughly a 400 year period of time. So the book of Judges begins pretty much with Joshua about to die. So Joshua was roughly 30 at the time of the Exodus. He was with Moses for 40 years in the wilderness, putting him at 70. And then he reigned for another 40 years um, before the book of Judges kind of officially begins. So he dies uh, at 110. And so we'll go right into that. Judges chapter 2, verses 8 through 12. It says, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died. And what a great way to be described. That's like he was son of Nun and servant of the Lord. That was his occupation died being 110 years old, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath Harris in the Mount of Ephraim on the north side of the hill Gash. And also all of that generation were gathered unto their fathers, and there arose another generation of them, or after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam, and they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, which brought them out of the, the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the gods of the people that were round about them and bowed themselves unto them and provoked the Lord to anger. So the first phrase that comes to my mind uh, when we hear this that is basically as soon as the, the leadership that had brought them through these incredible miracles, the people that had seen the first generation that actually saw the Exodus, that saw Joshua lead the people over the River Jordan, that saw all the things, that, the, the plagues. Once all these people were gone, and these were just stories, right? It says that they knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. They may have heard about them, but this rising generation had not seen those things. And, you know, we learned uh, that the Canaanites were not utterly destroyed. The people in the city of Jericho were, but the land round about, the regions round about, there were still people living there that God did not destroy or have the Israelites challenge. And they began adhering to their customs. So the phrase that comes to mind is being living in the world, but not of the world, right? Not of this world. And it's clear that the Israelites forgot that they were supposed to be a peculiar people. They were. They forgot that they were supposed to be different. They wanted to be like the world and be accepted of the people that lived in the regions around about them. It's very similar to what's going on in our day that, you know, people don't necessarily want to stand up for the Lord and, you know, 
be a witness of him at all times and all things. It's easier just to, you know, have a relationship with God on Sundays and the rest of the week you can just kind of, you know, have whether it's, you know, conversations with coworkers or the the way you are with your friends that you don't adhere to the same standards as if, you know, the Lord were with you in the room, that you are of the world and you're living in the world rather than not being of the world, right? But being required to live here for your mortal experience. So the Book of Mormon is kind of the Book of Judges, like the not like the time period in Alma, Book of Judges, but just the entire Book of Mormon is this more or less a pride cycle. Right? The Nephites are righteous. They come unto the Lord. They're blessed. As they're blessed, they get prideful. As they're prideful, their enemies come and they destroy them or they destroy themselves. And then they lose it all. They're humbled. Once they're humbled, they repent. Once they repent, the Lord forgives them. Once they're forgiven, the Lord begins to bless them. And so the cycle continues. And what we see is the same thing happening in the book of Judges, which just shows me um, how merciful the Lord is. Like he really does want us to repent and he really does want to give us 70 times 7 number of chances which is exactly what happens in the book of Judges. Like every page, it's like, oh, and they forgot again. So we're going to go, we just finished verse 12. We're going to go to verse 14, read verse 14 through 17. And the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel, and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers that spoiled them. And he sold them into the hands of their enemies round about so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Verse 15 Whithersoever they went out, the hand of the Lord was against them for evil. As the Lord had said, and as the Lord had sworn unto them, and they were greatly distressed. Nevertheless, the Lord the Lord raised up judges, which delivered them out of the hand of those that spoiled them. And yet, they would not hearken unto their judges, but they went a-whoring after other gods, and bowed themselves down unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in, obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. The The Lord is using the people in the regions round about to be a scourge and a reminder unto the descendants of Moses and the Israelites so that they could be stirred up to repentance. Does that sound familiar? This is First Nephi, and you can pause this if you want to find this and read it for yourself. First Nephi 2, verses 23 and 24. So this is right there at the beginning of the Book of Mormon. Verse 23, for behold, in that day that they, the Lamanites, shall rebel against me, I will curse them even with a sore curse, and they shall have no power over thy, the Nephite seed, except they shall rebel against me also. And if it so be that they, the Nephites, rebel against me, they, the Lamanites, shall be a scourge unto thy seed, the Nephites, to stir them up in the ways of remembrance. It's really similar to what God is doing in the book of Judges, using the people, the the Midianites and the Amorites and the Canaanites to be a scourge, to stir them up to remembrance. So I just think that's that's really important that there is a pattern. I think that is the lesson that we want to get out of this, the pattern that the Lord follows. In the book of Judges, he uses judges or people that uphold the law, right, and, and judge the people according to the law that was given to Moses to bring about righteousness. In our day, it is prophets and apostles, but it is the same thing. Those who uphold a standard and 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 hold the standard uh, and are the mouthpiece of the Lord to declare a standard, and if the people choose to accept the standard, that they will be blessed. If they choose to reject the standard, they will be punished, right? And those punishments come in different ways and at different times. And so, now that we talked about that similarity in 2 Nephi, let's read uh, 18 and 19 of Judges chapter 2. It says, And when the Lord raised them up judges, then the Lord was with the judge and delivered them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge, for it repented the Lord. And if we look at that footnote for repented, in Hebrew it means to be sorry or moved to pity. So the Lord uh, had sorrow because of their groanings by reason of them that oppressed them and vexed them. And it came to pass that when the judge was dead, that they returned and corrupt themselves more, more than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down unto them. 
they ceased not from their own doings nor from their stubborn way. That is tough to even read this. These people are just so so silly and backwards. But I think um, what causes this, this to happen is we have to zoom out, right? Because there is a, a bit of a time gap in here. It's not just Joshua. We read it as Joshua died the next day that they were evil. But it probably Joshua died and some uh, time passed. Maybe it was a year. And all of a sudden, you don't have this this visual reminder of what the Lord has done that's been with you for the last 30 years as your leader. It's a little tougher to to always have that. If we're not constantly, you know, nurturing our testimonies, it doesn't matter if we had seen an angel. You know, the, the, that, the reminder of that angel comes in talking about it, sharing our experiences with others, bearing testimony of the Lord. That is what keeps us constantly stirred up to repentance, right? Without having to be uh, brought to repentance through a, a scourge. So let's hop into Judges. Now that we laid a, a fairly decent foundation, let's ju- uh, hop into Judges chapter 3, uh, verses 10 through 12. So this is talking about um, Oth- Othniel, Oth- Othniel. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he judged Israel and went out to war and the Lord delivered a really long name, king of Mesopotamia into his hand and his hand prevailed against I'll give it a shot Chusan Rish Rishatham probably should have just left that one alone but verse 11 and the land had rest for 40 years and Othanel son of Kenaz died very next verse full stop and the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord and the Lord strengthened Iglon, king of Moab, or the Moabites, against Israel because they had done evil in the sight of the Lord. What was evil in the sight of the Lord? Was it just committing sins like we all do? No. These people continued to return to the gods of the people in the land, the gods of Baal and Ashtaroth. These deities that the Canaanites had created, right, and built altars and idols to, and the Israelites continued to return to those gods instead of the Lord. Forty years of peace, immediately they go back. Now, that's a lot longer than it seems, right? Forty years, I'm not even 40 right now. So imagine an entire lifetime without that miracle. Have you know? Now we've got 40 years of children. There are people 40 years old that weren't alive when it happened, right? I wasn't alive when the, the moon landing happened, right? Had it not been for video of people, you know, going up to the moon, would we even believe it now? Would we believe it? Or, you know, we heard this story, it almost like doesn't even sound like it could be true. We don't do it now, right? So I think that is part of the pride cycle is is forgetting, right? Not not that constant maintenance and needing our testimony uh, is what causes it to, to kind of disintegrate and, you know, entropy to happen. Verses 29 and 30 of that same chapter, it says, uh, verse 29, and they slew. So all this stuff happens. They go after the Moabites. And they slew of Moab at that time about 10,000 men, all lusty. And we click the footnote for lusty. It just means fat or hearty. So these were people that had a lot of wealth. They were eating really well at that time in the middle of the desert. If you were fat, you were doing real well, right? And all men of valor. And there escaped not a man. Verse 30, so Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest again for a score years. So another 80 years. So this big monumental delivery from bondage, and then an 80-year gap of rest in the land, right? So there's 80 more years where another two generations of people come along that weren't present when the other generation was lifted from bondage. So let's get into the meat. Judges chapter 4, we get to meet our first hero. Her name is Deborah. So uh, verse four, and Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. So Deborah steps in and she becomes the judge of Israel, right? And the judge of Israel, this is basically what Moses was, right? What before he, you know, created this entire network of, of priests under him and under him and under him, it was just Moses and then it was Joshua. And now Deborah is taking uh, that stead. And she dwelt under the palm tree of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel, in Mount Ephraim, 
and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. So imagine that there's a, a palm tree named after her. And they just know that palm, that's where you find her. The, the judge, she just said, yeah, she's out, out near the palm tree. Um, <clears throat> she's not living in a castle or some palace somewhere. She's very accessible to the people. And I, I like that. Um, verses uh, six through nine. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go and draw toward Mount Tabor, and take with thee ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and the children of Zebulun? And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, and his chariots and his multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. Now, if you're a member of our faith, and you hear that, what's the first thing you think of? That I will deliver Sisera the captain of the army, into thine hand. It sounds very similar to what the Lord said unto Nephi about uh, King Laban, right? That he would be delivered into Nephi's hands. Going back to those patterns, the, the repetition that the Lord provides in the scriptures, right? Nephi was told by the spirit. Uh, Barak was told literally by the voice of um, the, the prophetess at this time, Deborah. And Barak said unto her, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. Meaning, basically saying that I know that you have the Lord with you. I'm not so sure that he's with me, but if you come with me, then I can feel much more confident that whatever you say is going to happen will take place. Okay, verse 9, she says, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honor. For the Lord shall sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. She's going to battle with him, right? Verses 15 and 16. And the Lord discomfited Sisera. I look up discomfited. It says, panicked or put to flight. And all his chariots and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak. So that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. But Barak pursued, but Barak pursued after the chariots, and after the host, unto Herosheth, of the Gentiles, and all the hosts of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. Right. Thus, the word of the Lord being fulfilled through his chosen servant. And I know you're really curious what happens to Sisera. Verses 17 to 24, you are going to have to read that for yourself to find out how he dies. It's pretty gruesome, pretty wild, and we're not going to talk about it here. So you pause the video, read those verses, and you're back. All right, so let's jump ahead to chapter 6, and this is where we learn about the story of Gideon. This is an incredible story. Um, a lot of ways we can twist in, in a lot of little rabbit holes we can go down. We'll try to be as simplistic with it as we can. Uh, but first, we have to read verse 1 of chapter 6. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. So we're back. We're back on track with the hero cycle. Great. So back they're now in bondage, so they're going to need another hero. Uh, verse 6 and Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Oh, I wonder why. Do, do we know why they're impoverished? Probably because they were doing evil again. So, verses 7 through 10, And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppressed you and drave them from before you and gave you their land. And I say unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. Verse 11, And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Oprah, Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abazarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said, The Lord is with thee, 
thou mighty man of valor? And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then has all of this befallen us? And where be all of his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hand of the Midianites. So this is a great question, right? He's saying, if the Lord's with us, where is he? Because this isn't this isn't what we're dealing with now is not the same. You know, we're not being released from bondage like the people in the, the book of Exodus were. Like we're we're really stuck here. And they took everything from us. Like we used to have it, right? We heard those stories about we used to have riches. Well, we don't have them anymore. <clears throat> Verses 14 and 15. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And here's here's the best verse, right? So we're talking about patterns, right? The lesson is found in this verse right here. Verse 15. And he said unto him, and remember he's speaking to an angel, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. Gideon, he comes to the Lord, and the Lord says, hey, you're going to be the one to save Israel. And Gideon says, it can't be me. I'm of humble circumstances. No way you could use me, right? Does that sound really similar to maybe Samuel, or maybe maybe David, maybe maybe Daniel, some other prophets, right? The Lord does not care what we currently are. He only cares what we can become. And he knows what we can become because he can see the things that we cannot see. He looketh upon the heart, right? He doesn't see as man see it. So I like this part of the story because it shows the human element of Gideon. Uh, we're going to read verses 17 to 23. And he said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. Depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present and set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. And Gideon went in and made ready a kid, a lamb, and unleavened cakes of an ephath of flour. The flesh he put in a basket and he put the broth in a pot and brought it out under him, or he brought it unto him under the oak and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. And the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff, which was in his hand, and touched the flesh and unleavened cakes. And there rose a fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh of the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. And when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face, and the Lord said unto, him, said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. That right there, just like, you know, he, he thinks he's hearing the right thing, but that human element where he, just, just show me something, just show me like a little bit of light, that it's really you that's sharing, it's not just my the thoughts in my head, you know, how often have we felt that way, that we're not quite sure if it's the spirit, just show us something a little stronger, right? Verse 25 and 26. Now this is the setup that the Lord requires of him. He's like, all right, silly, you got your little sign. Now you're going to do something for me. This is how we start this thing off. Verse 25, and it came to pass that night, that same night, that the Lord said unto him, take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath and cut down the grove that is by it and build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer burnt sacrifice with the wood in the grove which thou shalt cut down. So I like this part too because we can clearly see that Gideon doesn't necessarily come from a gospel-centered home, right? His dad literally worshipped a false god and had an altar to this false god on their property. It's something that Gideon probably grew up seeing often, right? And it must have meant something to his father or else God would not ask Gideon to, to destroy all of this stuff. It kind of reminds me of the story that uh, President Nelson shared a few conferences ago when he, you know, he was not really raised in the church and his dad, uh, he didn't necessarily say that he was an alcoholic or not, 
but that he had a lot of alcohol in the house and Russell Nelson felt very convicted to smash all the bottles of alcohol, which <clears throat> I can imagine were not cheap, right? And think about uh, what Russell Nelson's father did or did not do in that story, if you remember the story, and think about what happens here, right? After Gideon destroys his father's altar and the grove of a tree surrounding it to make a, a fire unto the Lord instead of Baal. Before I get too far, verse 27 is cute because it says, Then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him, and so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day, that he did it by night. Right? And remember, just a few verses before, the Lord said, Hey, dude, trust me. It's me that's telling you to do this. You will not die. But there is still a little bit of, of that doubt, that human element, within Gideon, that he was still afraid, you know, he had the fear of man, that he was willing to listen to the Lord, but only at night. He's not going to do it in the day when everyone can see him, right? And, you know, it's so important that we grow out of that. Like, this is this is Gideon. That we're, we're learning that, that, you know, that the Lord's leaders, this you know, they still have this growing process. But how often are we like that? We're not really willing to stand up for the things that we believe in. We keep our mouth shut. Only in quiet places when we know no one's around do we say prayers, right? Only then will we read our scriptures. We don't want to, you know, make other people uncomfortable or, or talk about the Lord. It might make other people around us uncomfortable, right? Gideon was the same way. So Gideon does everything that uh, that he's asked to do. Then verse 30, then the men of the city say unto Joash, they found out it was Gideon, bring out thy son that he may die because he cast down the altar of Baal. He cast down your altar because he had cut down the grove that was by it. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let let him be put to death while it is yet morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself. Because one hath cast down his altar, saying, Why are you guys getting up so, so upset over over my altar for, for Baal? If, if Baal cares so much, let Baal do something about it, right? He can defend himself. And so, I like that Gideon's father defends him, and even though Gideon's father probably shared a lot in common with these people, he still didn't want his son to be punished, because he knew, really deep down he knew, just like Russell M. Nelson's father knew, that he shouldn't be drinking alcohol. Gideon's father knew he shouldn't have an altar unto a false god, right? He knew deep down in his heart. So we know at this point, Gideon is being prepared by the Lord. Uh, at the end of this chapter, he asks for a couple little miracles again, just to make sure that he's doing it for the, you know, that the Lord's leading him through it. Chapter seven, the Lord tells Gideon, all right, you got an army, but you got too many people in your army, right? If you got too many people in your army and I lead you through this battle and you win your battle, guess what? People are going to think that they did it by their own strength. They're not going to think that it was me that did it. This is a side of the Lord we don't get to see too often. Most of the time, the Lord really, really, really enjoys remaining anonymous. But this is one of those times that he did not want to be anonymous. He And he says, uh, this, this is how it reads. It says, The Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hands has saved me. The Lord has a plan, and he's going to show Gideon the plan in which he's going to whittle down to a very small number, right? And so we're going to read verses 4 through verse 7 of chapter 7. It says, And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. And so he brought down the people unto the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth the water with his tongue, as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, by the 300 men that lapped, will I save you and deliver the Midianites into thine hand and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. 
Now we know that it was uh, originally uh, over 32,000 people that Gideon had at his disposal originally. So he had 32,000. He sent 22,000 home, kept 10,000, and the, and the Lord said even that was too many. So think about that. Gideon actually goes down to the camp of the Midianites, and he spies on them with one of his buddies. And while he's down there uh, spying, he hears one of them had a dream. He had a dream that there was a piece of bread that rolled through the camp and destroyed everyone. And uh, somebody interprets the dream and tells him, yeah, that's Gideon and his army. They're going to take a, they're They're going to destroy us all. And Gideon is uh, so overjoyed, he, he gives thanks to the Lord, hearing the interpretation that the Midianites have of the, the man's dream is that his people are going to win. And I think that gives him even more confidence. So as he goes back, he, uh, he has his plan in place, and he tells the, the groups of men that he's got 300 men. He's going to have three groups of 100. So he's going to be in one of the groups. And he wants the other two groups to follow his lead. So whatever he does, he wants them to do also. Uh, let's go to let's go to verse eighteen. Let's go back. Uh, and when I blow a trumpet, I and all that are with me then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of the camp and say the sword of the Lord, and of Gideon. So Gideon and a hundred men that were with him came unto the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, and they had, but newly set the watch and they blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands and the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow withal and they cried the sword of the lord and of gideon and they stood every man in his place round about the camp and all the host ran and cried and fled so it was like they broke when it says they broke the pitchers it's like they broke their lamps turning out the lights, right? So it's like flipping off the light switch and saying, we're coming to get you and turn off the light switch. And this, knowing that they were surrounded, the people in the center of these 300, they didn't know how many there were. They just knew that there were, their enemies were on all sides of them. They, they were afraid. Um, and so we can imagine what happens that everyone kind of falls on the sword. They fight each other. So they, Gideon and his 300 men don't have to fight. Obviously they couldn't win a, a fair fight against tens of thousands of people. But because the lights go out, all the people end up killing each other. Gideon wins the battle. Judges chapter 8, a series of some other battles, and Gideon teaching some people some life-ending lessons uh, personally. Um, and you're welcome to read about those things uh, in the beginning of Judges chapter 8. Uh, verses 22 and 23 of Judges chapter 8 are the reason Gideon was chosen of the Lord. Remember, Gideon said of himself, I'm nobody from nowhere. I come from meager circumstances. And of those meager circumstances, I'm the least respected one of all my brothers. Why would you choose me to lead a victory over Israel? And this is why, because the Lord could see his heart. Verse 22, the men of Israel said unto Gideon, rule thou over us, both thou and thy son and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Now remember, this is the reason why God did not want Gideon's army to be so large, because they would take the credit. Now the people saw that Gideon had a small army, then it must have been Gideon that did it. It wasn't God. Gideon was there. He was so wise and so responsible. Verse 23, And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. There it is. The Lord, the Lord saw what Gideon would do with all that power and all that prestige and all that that glory that came from uh, being a, a vessel in the Lord's hand, all the things that were attracted unto Gideon for being prudent over what the Lord had asked him to do, and he gave the glory to God. He did not take it for himself. Verse 32, and Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in a sepulcher of Joash, his father, and it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead. This You can't make this up that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bareth their God. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerob Jerubal, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. What do we learn? 
that the Lord follows a pattern of behavior where he sends us leaders to plead with us to come unto him. And we also learn that no one can build a testimony for us. We can hear the testimony of others. We can hear the stories. But unless we build our own testimony, as soon as that person's gone, as soon as that missionary's gone, as soon as that bishop's gone and moves away, we're left under ourselves. And at that moment, when our, if our foundation is not the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a sandy foundation, even if those that our foundation are built upon are great men and women, like we've seen in the book of Judges, these great people that have been mouthpieces for the Lord as soon as they're gone because the people's foundation was not the Lord. It was Deborah. It was Gideon. It was uh, Othniel. As soon as these people are gone, the people return right back to where they were before. And so I plead with you to strengthen and sharpen your testimony of the Savior, right? That put on the whole armor of God. I I, I know from personal experience, from from being really, really close to him and then, you know, having periods of time where I wasn't so diligent in doing things that it's it's really easy. It's really easy to start questioning where the Lord is in your life. And, you know, as we read, Gideon was asking that question. We go back to the beginning of the chapter. The reason why the Lord's not there is because you you forsook him and you went a whoring after other gods. And, you know, in our day, I don't think a lot of people that leave the church per se are going to become parts of other faiths, but becoming of the world, right? And that's really what Baal represents in, in our lives is is choosing the world over the Lord, choosing the pleasures and delights of the world over the commandments of God. I'm so grateful for the commandments, how they keep us on the straight and narrow path. And I give glory to the Lord for these stories that help us to know that, that we're no different. We might have better technology, more, more toys, in our day, but we're no different from these people without constant maintenance of our testimonies. We will, we will succumb to the same fate as these people. And so will our children. And I leave these things with you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.